Good morning. Well, uh, Lord willing, for the next several weeks, we are going to be looking at the uh, letters written to the seven churches that are recorded in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. But for the purpose of today, we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 1, since the context of Revelation chapter 1 is very relevant in understanding what's going on in chapter 2 and chapter 3. Book of Revelation was written by Apostle John in 95 AD. That is some 30 years after the events of the book of Acts. Book of Acts basically covers, as Pastor Mike is going through it, it covers about a 30 years history of the church from the day of Pentecost, maybe about AD 32, 33, to about AD 62, 63. So Book of Revelation is recorded, is recording for us an evaluation by the Lord Jesus Christ of his church, basically, after 30 years of existence. And it's going to be very relevant because when we see what happens to the church within that short period of time, it really gives us a pause to really think about where we, as a group of believers, where we are in our walk with the Lord, where we, as a group of believers in his local body, Fellowship Chapel, where we are in our walk with the Lord, and it prepares us for what's going to happen in the future as well. However, there are certain reasons that people don't want to look at the book of Revelation. And we're going to look at those in a minute and, uh, and see what it is. People have different reasons. Some say it's too scary, you know. And they are right. Book of Revelation is a scary if you read it. There is all sorts of cosmic upheaval that is happening. There is judgment of God that is coming upon this planet Earth. So people often say, I really don't want to read the book of Revelation. I'd rather focus on God's love rather than on his wrath. Well, that is a very good thing to focus on God's love. We need to focus on that every day, every hour, every moment of our life. But God's love doesn't mean anything if we don't know what his wrath is like. If we don't know what it is that God is saving us from. You see, it, it is God's love that saves us from his wrath. And that gives us an understanding. Book of Revelation gives us an understanding. First of all, what kind of a God we have, a holy and righteous God, that he cannot tolerate sin, but he's long-suffering. So it is a scary time. There are events that's going to happen in the book of Revelation talks about that it is absolutely mind-boggling. Some other people say, well, nobody really knows the meaning of the book of Revelation. So people are always talking. Everybody has their own opinion. But remember, folks, this is the book of Revelation. It is a book of unveiling something, not veiling it. It is a book that is going to tell us about what God's plan for the future is. So it is not confusing if you know what you're looking at and what you're reading. And it is very important for us to look at that as well. We're going to come back to this a little later on. Some other people say that they are just totally, it is not realistic. They are confused. And they say, this is not realistic. This event is not happening. You cannot really see all these things. You cannot see that. It is a strange time. You have angels and demons that are going to be visible to naked eye. You have an angel that's going to be flying in the middle of the air, <coughs> proclaiming the gospel. How weird is that? That's really weird, right? It's strange. But see, the things that's going to happen in the book of Revelation is not normal for our standard of living. It is normal to our experience. 
but so it was before the flood of Noah. Bible records that for us, right? Before the flood of Noah, nobody had seen rain. Nobody had seen a storm. They didn't know the world was going to be wiped out, but it did happen. It is the same thing that happened right before the events in Sodom and Gomorrah. When Lot went and told his future son-in-laws to be that God is going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, they thought he's joking. They said, that's not realistic. But it did happen. The same thing that happened when God brought Israelites out of Egypt. When God told them that an angel of death is going to come and it's going to go through the city, and anybody that doesn't have the blood on their doorpost is going to get wiped out. They're going to have their firstborn killed. Egyptians didn't think that's not going to happen. We have never seen that. But it did happen. But there is, of course, all sorts of other excuses that people come up with. And, you know, they are limitless. But we really don't want to focus on the things why people don't want to read the book of Revelation, but rather why we should read the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation, first of all, notice that it says Revelation, and it is not Revelations. It is not plural. It is singular. This is one, one single vision that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to Apostle John. First of all, it shows the glory of God. What do I mean by that? You remember in Genesis chapter 1, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created... <coughs> male and female... <coughs> Excuse me. Male and female? He must have not known that there are other genders. <laughs> right? He just, just got it all mixed up now. But you see, folks... For 6,000 years, it has been male and female. All of a sudden. Now, let me tell you what's going on in our culture today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, if you're going to control the masses, the way to do it is do it so they cannot think properly. Right? So what we are involved with in our culture is this confusion that it is coming with terms and meanings. As you all know, we have talked about this with a number of you in the past. As you know, the way we converse with one another, it all has to do with categories. So if I hold this up, and I say I'm holding up a microphone, and you think that this is glasses. Now, when we are, talk, when we are talking about glasses, we are not communicating, because I'm thinking about something else, and you are thinking about something different. That is what's going on in our culture. In our culture, all the categories are becoming confused. And this, that is by design, actually. You see, the category of marriage has been confused. The category of family has been confused. The category of gender has been confused. The category of work has been confused. The category of human races have been confused. I'll tell you a little funny story. The other day, I was going to go for a medical examination, just a routine thing. They said, you go online and fill out this form. So I go online. And it had all these letters. You, you know, you put that name and all that. One part of it, it said sex. And it had male, female. Then it had other. <laughs> so. I put down other, <laughs> right? And so, of course, I have the rest of my information there. And then a while later, uh, somebody calls up, you know, when we were trying to make the appointment. And he's, she's trying to really find out what I meant by other, right? <laughs> so she did everything without saying, oh, you're male or female, right? She, every other question that you can think. So finally, at the end, I said, well, if, you, if it really is going to help you, at my birth, I was a boy. You know? <laughs> so, but that is exactly what's going on in the culture. Everything being confused. 
because that's how they're going to be able to control our mind. But you know what the Bible says? That the church of Jesus Christ is the pillar and support of the truth. Church of Jesus Christ is going to be the only body, the only live organism that it is not going to succumb to that. The church of Jesus Christ is going to be triumphant at the end. Now here, what we are talking about is that God told Adam and Eve, he said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Do you realize that during the course of human history, that has never happened? There has never been a member of human race that has subdued the earth. There has never been a member of human race that has brought fruit of righteousness on their own apart from the work of Holy Spirit. Now, at the end of history, if this doesn't hold up, if the earth is not subdued, what does that say? That God is not God. He made a command, he gave a command, and there was a force, there was a condition, there was a circumstance that prevented that command coming to fruition. And that cannot stand. So the book of Revelation tells us about what's going to happen at the end. It says, then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes back on this planet, he will reign for a thousand years. In that thousand year period, he will subdue the earth. A member of human race will fulfill the command of God. Number two, book of Revelation tells us about end of angelic conflict. We're gonna say a little bit more about that next time because it's a little bit more com uh, complicated. The time, our time won't allow here. But look what the Revelation chapter 20, verse two, 2 and 3 says. And he took off the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him in the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. So the angelic conflict that has plagued human race for all these 6,000 years is going to come to an end. And it's the book of Revelation that tells us about that. Number three, it tells us how this history is going to end. What's going to happen to this planet Earth? It's going to tell us that there is going to be a new heaven and a new Earth, one that is not contaminated by sin, one that is going to be in the presence of the Lord, worshiping him, having fellowship with him for eternity. Number four, it increases our faith. Now, you know, there is something that is going to be done. Let me just say this. Jesus Christ said that, we're going to get to that in a minute, that he tells us about the things that are going to happen ahead of time so that we would believe who he is when it does happen. Book of Revelation does exactly like that. So the believers at the time would know who Jesus Christ is. It's going to be an intense period of time during the tribulation. During the tribulation, there are going to be millions and millions of believers that are going to lay down their life because they are not deceived by the false Christ. They are not deceived by counterfeit Christ. And what's going to help that? The very fact that the book of Revelation sets out before the believers the events that are going to take place. So when the events happen, they already know about it. They say, yes, he told us. And number five, it gives hope to the believers. You and I, every one of us that is here, we all have issues in our life. There are difficulties, there are challenges. I mean, gosh, my heart goes out, Sandra is sitting here. 
How do you handle that in life when something like that happens to you? Right? How do you handle that? But you see, Book of Revelation is going to tell us. In Colossians, it says, by him, all things, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Right? And Revelation tells me, the 24 elders fell down before him who sits on the throne and they will worship him who lives forever and ever will cast their crowns before the throne saying, now this is in Revelation chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and because of your will they exist and they were created. That gives us hope because if God is controlling the entire universe. He must be controlling every little thing. You are either controlling everything or you are controlling nothing. You cannot have a control over the universe and there is some element of universe that is acting independently. And that gives us hope that when we go through the pain and suffering and sorrows that we have in our life, that my life is in control under the sovereignty of God. I may not like what is happening to me. Now listen, church, there is a lot of things that happens to us, to me, that we don't like. But God never said, I'm going to do everything for you to like. He says, I'm going to do everything that it is needed for you to conform you to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you deal with the marriage issues? How do you deal with relationship issues that are all coming around us and falling apart? Well, if it is about me, I'm going to have an issue because I don't see past my nose. Somebody said that your nose is too big. Maybe you just see, <laughs> maybe you have a problem. That's just my genetics, sir. But anyway, what the point being, dear one, the point being, Book of Revelation tells me that everything is in control of God. And I can rest assured that my life is under his control as well. Number six, it alerts believers about God's work in history. This is very important. The Lord Jesus, in Matthew 16, 2 and 3, he's talking with the Pharisees, and he's um, challenging them because of their lack of faith and unbelief. And he said, he replied to them, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. Here is, notice this word red. And in the morning, there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to discern the appearance of a sky, but are you unable to discern the sign of times? And it's interesting, really, when you look at it. In both cases, the sky is red. Uh, one time, Jim Brown had his Bible, and it was all red. Somebody told him, Jim, when they say that your Bible, you are supposed to have your Bible read. That's not what they meant. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jim, but <laughs> you should highlight it with yellow. <laughs> but anyway, so in both cases, the sky is red, but they are interpreting it differently. Now, why is that, right? Why is it that people would be able to interpret Differently, because they had empirical data. They knew what's going on. They knew what happens when the sky is red in the morning versus the sky is red in the evening. And they had empirical data with the Lord Jesus Christ. And they wanted a sign. And he said, no sign is going to be given to you except that of Jonah. We just went through the book of Jonah in 
uh, men's meeting. As Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so the son of man shall be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. That's your empirical data. I'm not going to do anything. You guys are blind. You see the dead is uh, brought back to life. You see the deaf can hear. You see the blind can see. You see the lame can walk. And you say, give me a sign? Now let me say also another thing. In our culture today, there is all sorts of information coming from every which direction, as you know. The problem is never with the data. The problem is how you interpret the data. Two people can stand on the top of Grand Canyon, and one evolutionist and one believer in creation. Evolutionist looks at it and says, wow, look at billions of years of Colorado River. Look what it can do. And creationists can look at the same thing and says, wow, look at the flood of Noah. <laughs> See, the same piece of data, but different interpretation. So we really need to know so we can interpret the data correctly. Book of Revelation gives us information so we can interpret the data of the stuff that is happening correctly. Lord Jesus, on another occasion, this is when he was coming up to Jerusalem. He was sitting on a donkey. He says, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known on this day, even you, the conditions for peace, but now they have been hidden from our, your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will put up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and they will level you to the ground and throw down your children within you, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize. You did not recognize the time of your visitation. The Lord Jesus Christ expected that the Jews would recognize the very day that he's going to be crowned king in order for the kingdom to be established. His disciples realized it. They took their clothes off and they put palm trees and they said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's a messianic psalm. But the Jews didn't. You know, in Daniel chapter 9, it gives the exact number of days that the Messiah is going to come into Jerusalem to be presented to the nation as king. But why didn't they accept them? Well, because just like today, they didn't like the political ramification. They said, well, if we are going to go and accept him as Messiah, the Romans are going to come and take away our place. And today, you see it all the times. People are switching sides. They are switching their affiliation. They are switching their loyalty. I'm talking about politicians. Just for the purposes of gaining political power. And that just gives me something. I was just talking with Diana before the church. You know, election season is upon us. I'm not making a political statement, but I'm making a political statement, right? <laughs> so let me explain what I mean. Political season is upon us, and we're going to be voting for people that are going to go into office. We better know who we are voting for. You know what the Romans says? Book of Romans says that though they know the judgment of God, that those who do these things deserve death. Not only they do it, but they will also encourage others to do the same thing. So if you get, just an example, if you get a Supreme Court justice that's confused about gender, what a woman is, this is not a political statement, fact. If a case comes before her, 
that has to do with that confusion. How do you think she's going to vote? So we better know. We have a number of people amongst us that are running for political office. You want to support them because you know them at least where they stand, right? So it is good for us to know. So the Lord Jesus expected the nation of Israel to know when he's coming that he's going to be the king of the Jews, but they rejected him. Book of Revelation will do the same thing because look what it says. And give, this is about the patterns, so uh, I'm going to explain it to you in a minute, what, what, where we are in history. Because we want, to, we want to really explain the trends. We want to know the trends. Things have long tails, right? We know the book of Revelation chapter 13 tells us, and he, this is the false prophet, that is the sidearm of the counterfeit Christ. And he causes all the small and the great, the rich and the poor, and the free and the slaves to be given a mark on the right hand and on their foreheads. And he decrees that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now notice here what it says. He will cause all. And then he goes on just to make sure that, you know, people may say, well, all, he really doesn't mean all. It just means just a few people that are living in Jerusalem at the time. Now, that's not what he means. He means all. All means all, right? Cause all. The small and the great, the rich and the poor, the free and the slave. That covers everybody. So he's going to cause all of them take on the name of the Antichrist or counterfeit Christ. Now, if you talked about that 50 years ago, 100 years ago, they would say, no, nah, that's not possible. How are you going to get everybody on the planet Earth to do that? With today's technology, is it there? It is there. You know it is there, right? So this alerts us about the patterns that are developing in history. So we would know, basically, what is coming on. So we would be alert about it. As I said earlier, folks, the Church of Jesus Christ is the pillar and support of the truth. Pillar and support are under constant, constant pressure. Don't count it, as Peter says, don't count it the strange things when you have fiery trial coming on your way. God has appointed us not only to believe on his name, but to suffer for his sake. We have been blessed in this country that we can gather together right now in freedom. I have people in Iran, you know, they talk about the church. The churches don't gather together. Government has shut them down. They meet in houses. But what government has done now, they have made the spies out of everybody. And they say if you go and see somewhere that there is a lot of cars that are parked, you report it to us. Then they come and raid the home. The church is under incredible amount of pressure all around the world. We are blessed in this country. Mel was praying for our president and our leaders. Yeah, that's a leadership God has given us, and we should pray for them. They may not be able to read teleprompter, but that's not the point. <laughs> we should still need to read it because the policies that they implement affects every single one of us. So why would we pray for them? Because the Bible says that we should have government that's going to bring about an environment <clears throat> that it is peaceful that the gospel of Jesus Christ can be preached. That is the purpose of it. And then number seven, and that is not, <coughs> excuse me, least 
But that's very important because I'm going to be reading Revelation chapter 1, and uh, I want to launch from that. Now, you notice I only selected seven, you know, because Book of Revelation has a, what they call a heptatic structure. Everything is in sevens. There are seven churches. There are seven spirits. There are seven seals. There are seven bowls. There are seven, you just name it. There are 7,000 people that die in an earthquake. There are seven trumpets. You go on and on. There are seven blessings. Somebody has said that you cannot count all the sevens that are in the book of Revelation. They have catalog about 125 of them. Now, why is that? Because seven is the number of completion. Everything is going to be completed. So I thought I'd complete that section by number seven. Now, there could be a whole lot more. But anyway. So I'm going to read Revelation chapter 1 in its entirety. Now, notice what it says. This gives you a special blessing. This is the only book of the Bible, the only book of the Bible that says, if you read me, you are going to be blessed. All of God's word is important. And we have to study and read all of God's word. But book of Revelation is the only one that gives you a special blessing. It says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and keep the things which are written in it, for the time is near. So I'm going to be blessed because I'm going to read it. You're going to be blessed because you're going to hear it. You can be doubly blessed if you read along with me. <laughs> you really can be blessed if you heed what's in it, right? So let's see. I was going to read from Amplified Bible, which Jeff likes, but not, not today. <laughs> not today. It's, uh, <laughs> so I'm going to read from uh, maybe New King James Version. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. John, to seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Incidentally, that is God the Father. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so. Amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. He was exiled there just in case, you know, the tradition has it that uh, the mission, the emperor tried to boil him and he didn't die. So to just get rid of him, get him out of Ephesus, he just uh, exalted him to the uh, island of Patmos, which is off the coast of today's Turkey in the Asian Sea. So I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book, send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Tythyra, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lamps there, and the midst of the seven lamps now one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair 
were white like wool, as white as the snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am the one who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Right now, here is in chapter 19, in verse 19, it is giving us the outline of the book of Revelation. It says, write the things which you have seen. That is the glorified Christ. And the things which are, the things which are, are the seven churches. That's chapter 2 and 3. And the things which shall take place after this, that starts at chapter 4. So if you go to chapter 4 of Revelation, you see that it starts with the word after these things. And that's what it says. So the book of Revelation gives us its own outline, how to understand it. Write the things that are, you have seen, the things that are, and the things that's going to take place here after. The word church doesn't appear in the book of Revelation after chapter 4 through, ch through chapter 19. Because that period of time has nothing to do with the church, per se. We believe that by then the church is already raptured. The scene is from the heaven, not on earth. That's for another time, another subject we talk about it. Write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which shall take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So everybody's blessed. Now, we're going to look at some of the verses just to make sure why some of the confusion is coming from. You see that in Revelation chapter 1, in some of your translation, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his bond servants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bond servant, John. Okay? And you see the word soon also appears at the end of the book of Revelation. And he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirit of the prophets, sent his angel to show his bondservants the things which must soon take place. So this word soon has caused a lot of discussion and debate in the church history. Okay? So we want to clarify it a little bit to see where we are coming from. The word soon may mean nearness of an event, something that soon is going to take place, something that's going to happen within the next half an hour, that soon is going to happen. So he's talking about the nearness of the events. It's a future thing, right? But the word soon has also happened to be used in the Bible as word quickly. You see in Acts 22:18. He says, and I saw him saying to me, hurry and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. So the word that's translated here quickly is the same thing as the word soon that has been translated in Revelation. In Acts chapter 12, verse 7, he says, and behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly stood near Peter and a light shone in the cell and he struck Peter's side and woke him saying, get up quickly and his chains fell off his hand. We were just talking about the angels are funny, aren't they? I mean, when they come, it's not like, hey, Peter, hey, Peter, will you get up, please? Whack! <laughs> get up! You know, it's just, I don't know what it is with them. I guess they have no feelings, maybe. I mean, you know, <laughs> don't they know that we gotta take a nap? I mean, you know, but anyway, but here is the point is, the point is that what I'm making is that that word soon has been translated two different ways. So what does it mean, actually, 
in the, you know, when we say soon, how do we see this? Well, the book of Revelation, I alluded to this earlier, there is a lot of confusion amongst people. How do you interpret the book of Revelation, right? And if you don't interpret it properly, you're going to be really confused about the things that's going to happen. There are four different views that the book of Revelation has been interpreted. This is by those who believe that the Bible is the word of God. I'm not talking about unbelievers. You know, there was a um, movie called Hunt for Red October. I don't know if you all saw it, right? In it, it has uh, a, a scene where one of the uh, Russian commanders that's defecting to the U.S., you know, codes from the revelation, you know, and, and he says, and, you know, he's talking about that. But anyway, um, unbelievers talk about the book of Revelation a lot. In fact, believe it or not, a lot of the movies that are made nowadays, they take inspiration from the book of Revelation. Have you wondered why we have so many movies that has to do with superheroes? We have the, uh, um, I don't know what they are because I don't watch these movies, but there are like uh, Spider-Man, you have like the Superman, Iron Man, I don't know, all these men, <laughs> right? You know why that is? Because the devil is preparing people. Like I said, Book of Revelation is going to be in a strange time. You're going to have strange things happening. People are going to see demons. They're going to see angels. They are being prepared now through the movies that they see. That when those things happen in the future, they say, ah, that's just AI. That's just artificial intelligence. That is not real. So if you see an angel flying like an eagle in the midair and proclaiming gospel, and you have grown up with a Spider-Man and with Birdman and whatever man, and you see that, oh, an angel. No, you're going to say, yeah. It's another one. That's just like my friend the Spider-Man. I know him. That's what's going on. So they get a lot of inspiration. The devil is very smart. He's preparing the generations for what's going to take place. So there are four different views of the book of Revelation. The first one is what we would call the idealist view. Idealist view is basically looks at the book of Revelation. It says, well, they interpret it allegorically. They say this is just a cosmic war between good and evil. Right? This is just a cosmic war between good and evil, and at the end, good is going to triumph. Right? Now, I'm, I'm going through this fast. There is a paper that I have put on the offering table that explains these four views in more detail. If you like, you can take one, and if you don't have enough, I'll bring more copies next week because it was good bread, it was. When you get old, you know, you just can't carry a whole lot of weight, right? And the coffee machine jams. <laughs> then you have the view that is called the preterist view. Preterist means past. The preterist view says that all the events of the book of Revelation already happened in the first century. And they say all the events that he's talking about in the book of Revelation happened when Rome under the leadership of Titus, sacked Jerusalem. So they get all of that. The reason for it is because they want to get all the bad things out of the way. They want to talk about God's love, well, which is wonderful. But we got to know what's going on in history, too. So the preterist says all of this thing has happened in the past. Let's put them over there. And then we can talk about all the good things. Well, the problem is that the book of Revelation was written in AD 95. So in order for them to really show and prove that it had happened in the past, they have to push the date of the book of authorship of the book of Revelation back to before AD 70. But there is a lot of things that just don't jive up. The paper will explain it to you because we don't have time to do it. Then there is the Historic, historicist view. Historicist view says that the book of Revelation basically explaining the history during the course of dispensation of the church. 
So in 2,000 years, the book of Revelation is explaining what's going on in these 2,000 years. The problem with that is everybody in their own generation, they take part of the book of Revelation, interpret it based on what's going on in their own life. So it becomes a newspaper exegesis. You look at an event in newspapers, ah, that is in the book of Revelation. But what we hold here is a futurist view. We believe that everything that ha- after chapter 3 of the book of Revelation is taking place in the future. They haven't taken place yet. They are in the future. Now, let me explain something. All of these discussions has to do with the millennium. What is millennium? Book of Revelation in chapter 20 Let me see if I can go to that for a minute. We read part of this, but I want you to listen to this and count with me how many times it says thousand years. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of the old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up, and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a while. And I saw throne, and they sat on him, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness of Jesus Christ and the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their forehead or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. See, that's number three. But the rest of the dead did not come live again until the thousand years were finished. That's four. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second uh, death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Five times the book of Revelation talks about a thousand years. Now, people say, well, the thousand years, that is, that's where the word millennium comes from. Mill means a thousand. So millennium, all millennialism means all negates it. That means those who don't believe there is a thousand-year reign of Christ on earth. They think of this earth as uh, they interpret the whole Bible in a sense, the future events in allegorical terms. So they say the thousand years means just a long time. Some say that the thousand years is actually talking about now, that we are already in kind of kingdom. Well, as somebody has said, if you are in the kingdom, I must be living in the ghettos. (laughs) Because it sure doesn't see any lamb and lion laying together. I don't see the peace that the Bible, Old Testament, talks about. So there is our millennialism that says there is no thousand years rule of Christ on this planet. Then there is the pre-millennialism, which we believe, that we believe that Christ is going to come before the thousand years, and then he will set up his kingdom. There is those people that are in the middle that are called post-millennialism, that they say that Christ is going to come after the millennium. But they are more aligned with the amillennialists. The post-millennialists are the uh, more, how should I say, more encouraging view of the amillennialism, that this is the history, this is the millennium, and the, you know, the world is going to become more and more and more Christian until Christ comes. Well, we don't see that happening, right? It's the other way around, right? So there are not that many of them around anymore. Now, on the premillennialism, there are three different views for rapture of the church, when rapture takes place. Those that believe that the rapture of the church takes place after the tribulation, the seven years of tribulation. They are called post-tribulationism. There are those who believe that the rapture 
takes place in the middle of tribulation. And then there are those who believe, like us, that the tribulation happens before the millennium. So you can be a post-tribulationist, but pre-millennialist. Or you can be a mid-tribulationist, but a pre-millennialist. You see what I'm saying? It can get a little bit confusing. So rapture has to do when the church is caught up. You see, there is a big difference between the church and Israel. <clears throat> God didn't make a covenant with Israel and then says, yeah, you know, you guys did really bad. I think I'm going to forget about my covenant and I'm going to replace you guys with this group of people called church. That doesn't happen. You don't want to worship that God. You remember what the Lord Jesus told Nicodemus when he was telling him about the new birth? He says, unless a man is born again, he shall not see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus says, how can that be? Can a man go back into his mother's womb again? He says, you are the teacher of the Jews and you don't know this? In other words, Old Testament talked about it <clears throat> because when Old Testament talks about being circumcised in heart, that is the terminology for being born again. And then the Lord told Nicodemus, he said, we tell you the things that are earthly. If you don't believe those, if you don't believe the things that are earthly, how are you going to believe the things that are heavenly? What does that mean? That means Nicodemus, the things that are early, earthly, rather, those things, you have empirical data. You can verify it. If you don't accept that, how are you going to accept about the things that you, don't verify? you cannot verify? See, God hasn't given us a faith that is just a blind faith. He has also given us a sense of logic, rationality, because our God is rational. And he wants us to understand. We have to learn to think like a God. They don't teach that in the schools anymore. They, don't, they never taught it at the schools. It's only in the Bible that you learn how to think about God's thought. Why did God give man his brain? Because God wanted man to think God's thoughts after him. So if you're not using your brain to think God's thoughts after him and you're thinking in humanistic terms, you come up with all sorts of reasoning that is wrong. How do you know what is the truth now, let me say this. I know we are deviating a little bit, but let me say this. When you're talking about the truth, truth has different levels that God has given man. There is a truth that you can verify. You know, gas is going through the roof. It's expensive, right? If I tell you there is a gas station that sells gas for 98 cents a gallon, you say, where is it? You get into the car, and you can go and verify it. That's one level of truth. That is what God did in the garden. So when you have math, when you have science, those are the truth that you can verify because God has put the laws in nature. There is a level of truth that you really don't know. We hear all this stuff that's going on with our government, all the things that's going on in Ukraine, all the things that's happening, and you hear it on the news, how do you know which one is the truth? You don't. The only way you come up with a conclusion depends on what you think of the guy that's reporting it. If you think the guy that's reporting it has a good character, you take it as a truth. You believe that. The other guy that you think he's not a good character, they lie, you are not going to take what they say as a truth. So you cannot verify that, right? Some people may know what the truth is, 
but you and I don't. Then there is another level of truth that nobody can verify. When it comes to the issue of creation, who can verify that? Nobody can verify that. So depending on what we think of the character of our God, that is when we either accept it or we reject it. Now, how do we accept God's truth in the Bible? It all depends about what this thing called hermeneutics. Hermeneutics talks about how you interpret the Bible. Now, I read you that passage about a thousand years. It talks about a thousand years for five times. Now, if let's, let's play a silly game for a minute. Let's assume we are God, and we want to write to our creatures about the thousand-year reign of Christ. How would we write that, other than what's written? You see, when you read the Bible, you have to believe that God means what he says, and he says what he means. If you are writing a letter to somebody, how do you want that letter to be interpreted? The way you wrote it, or however they want to interpret it? So if I wrote the letter to somebody that says, hey, we go to church, and it has really red seats, and it has black legs, and we have a wooden podium, and my sister would get that and says, oh, he's talking about Christ. Red is talking about his sacrifice and his blood. Black talks about sin. And wood talks about the cross that he was crucified on. How silly is that, right? But that's exactly what happens in the Bible. With this theologian that they end up interpreting the Bible allegorically. Now, are there things that are similes in the Bible? Yes. But we know that because the way that we converse with one another, we understand that. If I am here and I tell somebody, hey, run to the store and buy something for after church, do I literally mean that they need to run? They don't, right? But now, if a little kid goes at the store and I say, hey, you run to catch the kid, we know what I mean, right? So we know that because God has programmed us that way. We don't need to have a guess. So your hermeneutics is, is that the more you are interpreting things toward amillennialism, you are allegorizing things. The more you take the Bible at its face value, you are in a literal interpretation. So the more you go on this side, you become premillennialist because you look at that and you say, hey, that's what the Bible says. But if you end up allegorizing it, it becomes confusing. Now, what is the problem, the big problem with allegorization? What is the problem? The problem with allegorization is that you transfer the authority from the Bible to yourself. Because allegorization only is truth in my mind. So no longer what God says is the truth, but how I'm interpreting it is the truth. And that's a big danger, because we transfer the point of authority. And God says, I will not share my glory with anyone. And time has run out, so let's close with a word of prayer. Now, before I go, if there is anybody here, if you do not know Jesus Christ, there is a period of history that's going to come upon this earth that is awful because God is cleansing his planet before he comes back and rules, just like he did during the time of Noah. He cleansed, he cleansed everything out and then it started over again. So if you are here, you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, you really want to think about it because there is no other name under heaven which is given that men can be saved by except the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because from him 
through him, to him is all things. So you want to think about that. This world and all of its glory is passing away. But what remains is the word of God and the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. God loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son to die on your behalf. Believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as Melchred is not a difficult thing. It's very simple. He asked Peter, he said, he asked his disciples, he said, who do the people say that I am? Oh, you are Elijah, you are John the Baptist, you are one of the prophets. Who do you say that I am? And God is asking that question of you today. Who do you say that Jesus Christ is? Is he just a good man? Well, he couldn't be a good man. He lied a lot if he wasn't God. Was he a prophet? No, he was a prophet, but not in the sense that Muslims believe that he was a prophet. Jesus Christ has three offices, right? He has the office of a prophet, a priest, and a king. The first time he came around, when on this planet Earth, he came as a prophet. When he was in the upper room with his disciples, he has started functioning as a priest. To this day, he is our high priest. He's functioning in that capacity, sitting on the throne of his father, waiting until the father delivers the kingdom to him. When he comes back, he's going to come back as a king. And the Bible says that his robe will be drenched with blood. It's an awful thing to fall into the hand of the living God. So you may want to really consider that. Give your life to him. Trust him. Ask him to come into your living your life in your heart. Jesus Christ is not just an insurance policy. He is the creator. He has created you and me for his own glory, that he would come and dwell in our hearts. How awesome is it that God can dwell, that our bodies can become a temple of Holy Spirit? So let's pray. Our Father, we come before you and we thank you for so great salvation that we have through the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for his sacrifice for us. Thank you for his love for us. For it pleased you, O oh Father, that your son would go to the cross to be sacrificed on our behalf. For there is nothing that we bring before your throne except a broken heart. So today we enter boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy during time of trouble. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness and your truth. Thank you that you have preserved the text of a scripture all these years that those who seek you may know what your thoughts are. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness to us. And we pray that as we go, you touch our hearts, you touch our mind, Lord. Anoint us that we may know and have a close and tight relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ through the power of Holy Spirit that indwells our hearts. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. All right, you all may rise for the benediction, if you would. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for all generations, forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All dismissed. Thank you. Mm -hmm.